But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. When we think about the kingdom, most brothers think of like in small, minute terms. No, but the vastness of the kingdom, the greatness of the kingdom, dealing with the knowledge, wisdom, understanding, and the information alone that we're going to receive when we get to the kingdom. That's on a whole nother level. Foremost, I would like to give all praise and glory unto Yahweh, Bahashem Yahweh Shah, Bahashem Rakhadash. Double honors unto the apostles and the elders of GMS, who rule well, teach well, being great examples to us younger brothers. And peace and blessing, salutations to the whole flock out there pushing His word and truth, and in sincerity across the four winds. In the name of Yahweh Bahashem Yahweh Shah, pushing to get up out of here. Shalom to the whole flock, the believers, the listeners. Who have came back to the obedience of the scriptures through faith in Yahweh Bashim Al Shah. 
all right and what i want to get into today you know is address a lesson done by the beloved elder brother yasha wamba all right the head of gms dallas camp all right which is channel is remnant save 144 subscribe to be edified okay and i'm responding to his lesson miserable are the cities which all right miserable are the cities where we serve captivity you know which that's a um, precept you know paraphrasing of a precept okay in the book of baruch the fourth chapter you know because what we're witnessing is the judgment of the lord open up more and more in the earth you know and the, and the, and the lord's judgment okay is not random you know as he jacks you know high people up <laughs> you know on a daily basis he jacks these Edomites up and these other nations, man. Everything is it goes back to your how about Shema Shah, okay, judging, you know, whether it's through the left hand or whether through his right. Okay, we know the Heavenly Father, you know, is the orchestrator of all the judgment that we see in the earth. Okay? Matter of fact, let's get some precepts and then we're gonna address, you know, what this guy was saying. You know, I don't know exactly. Well, of course we know he knows he's an Israelite. You know, he's saying the most high. All right. But the mindset that he's in, which, you know, he was on point, you know, and he spoke about, you know, us not going um, to wage war on these devils, but the most high judging these devils, man. And this is what we preach. Okay. That these devils judgment is going to come from on high. All right. From your how about So let's get a couple precepts. Okay. Now, um, let's go here to Amos 3. Okay, in six, it says, Shall a trumpet be blown in the city, and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in the city, and the Lord have not done it? And let's read this in NLT. When a ram's horn blows a warning, shouldn't the people be alarmed? Does that does disaster come to a city unless the Lord planned it? Okay? So Yahweh by Shema Shai. Okay, he the one that orchestrates. Everything that we see, man, whether in blessing or disaster. Okay? Nothing happens, okay, unless the Lord ordains it, man. Alright? And this is something, this this is a perspective that you will never get, okay, from plantation Christianity, man. Those anti-messiahs. Alright? Verse 6, it says, I mean, verse 7 in the NLT, Indeed, the sovereign Lord never does anything until... He revealed his plans to his servants, the prophets, man. And we spoke on these things, man. Okay? We spoke. Uh, our apostles, okay, and the elders, their elders, okay, been speaking on these things. And now we've seen these things speak. Okay? Now these things are coming to pass. These prophecies are speaking louder and louder. The effect of every vision. Okay? Because you go here. All right? What it says in... um. Second Ezra 15. Let's get to the point. Second Ezra 15 and in, in, um, in 11. It says, But I will bring them with a mighty hand. Or I start at 10. It says, Behold, my people are led as a flock to the slaughter. I will not suffer them to dwell in the land of Egypt because there's a deliverance coming for the elect. If the judgment, okay, heightens, you know, intensifies, eventually the Lord, all right, is going to deliver his elect. For the ultimate destruction This is just the beginning Okay If you got a weak stomach for judgment <laughs> You see that we just getting started The Lord just getting started man Okay he said But I will bring them with a mighty hand And a stretched out arm through Yahweh Shai And smite Egypt With plagues as before And will destroy all the land thereof man So we're going to see the Lord Constantly plague this place Through storms Through famine through civil unrest, through pestilence, and ultimately through, all right, a uh, 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 nuclear destruction, man. Okay? So the prophets, you know, have been speaking on these things, and it's the Lord that's bringing it to pass. And he put the Spirit on us to speak on these things, man, before they come to pass. All right? And just like Elder Yasha Wumba was saying, you know, a Christian, okay, uh, uh, here, you know, they're talking point from their Jake, and, you know, be offended. Shows you how out of touch a Christian is, all right? Antichrist, <laughs> you know, you anti-Christians, okay? How out of touch they are with the Bible, 
You know, and this is why we call them uh, uh, anti messiahs because Yahweh Shai, all right, comes in the volume of the book. You know, so if you're against, you know, that 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 mindset that that Jake has of of uh, rejoicing in the vengeance of his enemies, okay, then you're out of tune with the scriptures. You're completely out of tune with the scriptures, man. Okay, and ultimately you're against the scriptures because you, all right, uh, 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 condemn, all right, the Lord's judgment, man. Okay, so let's go here to Malachi and see when you don't understand the characters of the Bible, you 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 you, you can't make sense of. It. Okay, you still think that there's you know Chinese and Japanese and. You know, you don't really understand the characters of the scriptures. You think that, you know, white people is a, is a nationality. Then you don't know what's going on. You can't make sense of anything, man. All right. But when you start, uh, you know, as, as you start putting, all right, these, these nations, biblical nationalities on them, then prophecy makes perfect sense. Okay. Malachi 1 and 4, where, where is Edom? Okay. You see that? Matter of fact, let me start here. Let me start at one. It says, The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, said the Lord. Yet ye say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, said the Lord. Yet I love Jacob. Okay? So, not under, if you don't understand, okay, these two characters and who they are and the prophecy that's surrounding these two characters, all right, so which will represent two nations, you know, Jacob being the progenitor of the 12 tribes. You know, which are majority the so-called uh, uh, Negro, Latino, and Native American of today. You know, and we look like other nations. You know, due to us being scattered. Okay, but there's a, a lineage. Okay, of people in the earth that go back to Jacob, and there's a lineage of people in the earth that go back to Esau, Edom. Okay, and prophecy identifies them. Okay, in these times, as we will be under the curses. And Esau will be ruling with the sword. Okay, before he's judged and before the elect of Israel is delivered. Okay, and the, and the rulership of the earth is transferred to them. All right, through Yahweh Shai. All right, verse 3 it says, And I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness, man. And this was the fall of pagan Rome. Okay, during what they call the Dark Ages, you know, during the Byzantine Empire. Okay, the Moors, you know, which all Jakes was in, was in power. Okay, you had the uh, the medieval times in Europe when Jake was in, okay, in power. Okay, and Esau, you know, was was pushed <laughs> to the side. All right, but what happened? You had the Renaissance. Okay, his rebirth, you know, that thousand year period was. You know, fulfilled, and he was able to have influence, okay, and move around in the earth, man. Okay? Whereas Edom said, We are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus said the Lord of hosts, They shall build, but I will throw down. They shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord have in the nation forever. So the Lord has in the nation which is righteous anger towards these people. The Lord said he will allow this devil to build up and he will begin to throw down. Okay? So this is in tune with prophecy, man. You see? And the mindset of a believer, all right, when you go into the scriptures, okay? You go into the scriptures, let's go here. This is, um, Sirach 25. I want to say verse 7. Sirach 25 and 7 said, There be nine things which, have, which I have judged in my heart to be happy. And the tent I will utter with my tongue. A man that have joy of his children. And he that liveth to see the fall of his enemy. Okay? Our forefathers always had the mindset of seeing the fall of our enemies, man. Because these heathens, okay, are wicked. And Esau Edom is the wicked, man. Okay, these heathens have always, you know, uh, uh, been against our power, but no one more than Esau Edom. Okay, and they've been been against us. Okay, here it is. We've been getting jacked up all throughout history. 
Okay? The Lord, you know, has punished us for our disobedience. But Esau has, has done way more wickedness than, than, than we did. Okay? Esau's wickedness is destroying the planet. <laughs> you see, he's on a whole another level. But he, we shouldn't rejoice when this man, which is, which is destroying the earth, literally. The animals, the, the, the plants, food. Okay? Humans, like this man is, is, is destroying, all right, creation, literally, man. And when something happening to them, okay, the only people that's that, 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 that sad is you dumbass anti-Christians, uh, man. Okay? You anti-Messiah nigga Christians, man. You see? Now, let's go here. This is Sirach 36. Get to the point. It's uh verse seven. Well, I start here. Uh, at verse six, it says, "Uh, my, I start at one." Hey, and this is the mindset of our forefathers, man. Okay, which they they was in the right spirit. So, rock thirty six and one it says, "Have mercy upon us, O Lord, power of all, and behold us, and send thy fear upon all the nation that seek not after thee, man, and under the the, the rulership of Esau, Edom." All these uh, 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 nations, all right, are on the major rebellion against Yahweh Bashem Shah. There was a major rebellion in the earth, okay, with Esau at the forefront, man. Okay, and the Lord sends his fear through judgment. Okay, it said, lift up thy hand against the strange nations and let them see thy power. And we're, we're just seeing the, 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 the beginning of the Lord just really start to open up, man. Okay, he's been to showcase power to these nations, man. These nations have forgot. <laughs> okay, it says, As thou wast sanctified in us before them, so be thou magnified among them before us, and let them know thee as we have known thee, that there is no power but only thou, O power, man. And these uh, 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 heathens, beginning with Esau, Edom. Okay, because Esau boasts himself as a god in the earth. You know, the nation have feared him, feared him for the longest. They looked to him, okay, uh, of how to be in the earth, which is complete rebellion against righteousness, man. Okay, and that's why these nations are going to that thousand year captivity, a harsh, rigorous captivity for following, all right, the wicked Esau Edom. So this is just the beginning. Verse uh, six, it says, show new signs and make other strange wonders. Glorify thy hand at thy right arm, which is Yahweh Shai, that they may set forth thy wondrous works, man, because Yahweh Shai is going to be the ultimate showcase of the Heavenly Father's power in the earth, man. You know, when those chariots come back, when Yahweh Shai himself and those angels enter into this realm, that's going to be the peak of the Lord showing his wrath towards this earth, man. Okay, I say this is just the beginning. Verse 7, raise up in the nation and pour out wrath. Take away the adversary and destroy the enemy. Sake the time short. Remember the covenant and let them declare thy wonderful works. Let him that escape it be consumed by the rage of fire. And let them perish that oppress the people. Smite and sunder the heads of the rulers of the heathen, Esau, Edom, that say there is none other but we. So this is our forefathers making petition. To bring heavy judgment to these heathens, man, beginning with who? The wicked. Okay? And the Lord is going to magnify him, himself in the earth, man. Mainly through his son, Yahweh Shai. Okay? What did, what, what did the Heavenly Father tell Yahweh Shai? This is Luke 12 and uh, 28. Alright? And it says, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it. And we'll glorify it again. And how does the Lord glorify his name? Okay. This is uh, Psalms 9 and 16. Okay. This Psalms 9 and 16. It said, The Lord, Yahweh, by Hashem al Shai, is known by the judgment which he executed. Okay. So the Lord is known by his judgment in the earth, man. He made a reputation for himself in Egypt. He made a reputation for himself with Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay. When he flooded the earth. You see? 
But Esau has enchanted, you know, and deceived the world as if the Most High is nothing to be feared. Okay, so he got to make a hey, one more great example in the earth, man. Before these heathens go into captivity, man. All right, and it says the wicked is snared in the work of his own hands, man. So everything that these devils done, the Lord is getting ready to make it work against them, man. The thing that was working for this devil is now going to work against this devil, man. All right, until he's, you know, his, his kingdom is obliterated. Okay, and he's in captivity, man. Okay, so um, let's go here. Let's get one more. All right, and this is the New Testament, you know, because Christians, they hate they hate the Bible all together, but they especially hate the Old Testament. Well, let's go to the New and see that their mindset still, you know, remain. Second Thessalonians 1 and, and 6, seeing it is righteous, all right, seeing it is a righteous thing with the Most High to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, okay? And who has been... The, the, the biggest antagonist against us as a people okay throughout existence man these devils okay Esau eat them alright but it's a righteous thing with the heavenly father to pay them back for what they done because these devils they take they take everything too far and they, they they're at war without power they're, they're in the all out rebellion Okay, in the earth, man, they're leading the biggest rebellion the earth has ever seen. Okay, verse 7 says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us, you know, and this is what we tell our people. Ain't no sense of uh, marching and protesting and trying to get militant with the devil. There's no victory in that. Okay, crying to the devil to do right. Nah, man. Okay, <laughs> one thing that, that's just universally respected is power. Okay, no one respects someone begging. Okay, nah, man. The, 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 the biggest, the thing that that that's, that's reverence universally on every level is power. Okay, and you know, the Lord finna show power. Okay, it says unto you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Yahweh shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming. All right, in flame and fire, taking vengeance on them that know not the Most High and that obey not the gospel of our Lord, Yahweh Shai of Masiach, man. Okay, there's great judgment coming. And Lord will, if I can put this link in the, because uh, this is what he's talking about. Now you go here. Well, what I do, I, I just add it. I will write this, I can add it to the end of this video. Okay, so I just add it to the end of this video. I will write this out. Which is the evil history of flooding black towns. Okay. Which is about 16 minutes. You know, it's a good watch. I did a lesson on it before. You know. But just put it on there. Hey. Just, just, hey, we testifying against this devil, man. Okay. And anyway, yes, we praise Yahweh Bashim al Shai for dismantling the kingdom of the wicked. Esau Edom, man. Okay. And anyone else that's against. All right. Righteousness, man. All right. Anyone that's against our power. Hey. May you how about Shema Osha judge accordingly, man. Okay? <laughs> we don't have to do anything. We don't have to we 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 don't need one bullet. Okay? So Lord will you brothers and you sister edify to the next time I say shalom. Imagine living in a thriving black community where you could find refuge from discrimination and violence in the days when racism was at its peak. Such communities existed in the United States during segregation, and at least 200 of them were established by 1888. But as time passed, many of these communities disappeared from the map, completely erased from history. You may ask, how is that even possible? Why were these towns deliberately hidden and erased? And what can we learn from this dark and troubling part of American history? In this video, we will reveal some of the major black towns now hidden underwater or transformed into something else and their black inhabitants displaced. The first is the Seneca Village in New York City. Seneca Village, a once thriving African-American community, was established in 1825 on the outskirts of New York City at a time when African-American residents were facing legal segregation and discrimination throughout the country. At its height, the village covered an area from 82nd Street to 89th Street on Manhattan's Upper West Side, with approximately 300 black residents living within its borders. The people of Seneca Village had a deep sense of community and worked hard to build a prosperous and thriving neighborhood. Many black residents were property 
owners, with a rate five times higher than the city's average. Seneca Village had three churches, a school, and various small businesses, such as a grocery store, a shoemaker, and a blacksmith. However, the residents of Seneca Village faced many challenges, including discriminatory laws that restricted their freedoms and opportunities. As the city of New York began to expand and urbanization took hold, many wealthy New Yorkers sought to improve the area by creating a large park, which is now known as Central Park. In 1855, the New York State Legislature passed the act to lay out a public park in the city of New York, which authorized using the eminent domain to seize land to create Central Park. The residents of Seneca Village were accused of being a public nuisance and were forced to leave their homes to make way for the park's construction. The community was disbanded by 1857, and the residents were forced to relocate somewhere else, mainly to Manhattan's Lower East Side. The erasure of Seneca Village is one of many examples of systemic racism and forced displacement of black communities throughout American history. The people of Seneca Village had built a thriving and prosperous community against all odds, only to be pushed aside by the government and the wealthy elite. The loss of Seneca Village was a traumatic event for the African-American residents who were forced to leave their homes and businesses behind. Today, the only remnant of Seneca Village is a commemorative plaque dedicated in 2001 to the Lost Village. The story of Seneca Village serves as a reminder of the many vibrant black communities lost due to discrimination and systemic racism in the United States. But while this seems traumatic, many African Americans in Alabama faced a more devastating incident. Before we get into that, we'd like to introduce a new segment called Black Business Spotlight. Part of our mission is to uplift and empower the culture. And a great way to do that is by supporting black owned businesses. So today we'd like to share with you a company that focuses on empowering the community through reading and education. DTR 360 books. Hey, what's going on family? Assalamu alaikum, shalom, shalom, hotep, islam, alafia. So listen, DTR 360 books is the fastest online bookstore right now. All right, we have everything from common books. All right, we have everything from history books. That's right, we got this bad boy. We have everything like health books, and we got children books, religious books, listen, anything, you name it, we got. All right, definitely, listen, click the link in the bio, dtr360books.com, and find out what's all the hype about. Listen, a reading people is a rising people, so let's rise, family. You can't go anywhere without proper education. Peace. It's so important that we buy black and keep the dollar in our community. If you'd like to support DTR 360 books, click the first link in the description. Now let's get back to the video. Kualaja in Alabama. Lake Martin is a beautiful destination in Alabama, famous for its crystal clear waters, boating activities, and stunning sunsets. However, the lake has a dark history that few people know. Underneath the tranquil waters of Lake Martin lies the ruins of Kualja, a once thriving African American community founded in the late 19th century. Kualja was established by John Benson, a formerly enslaved person who had purchased thousands of acres of land in Alabama and sold it to other African American families. The community grew and prospered with its black owned railroad and was home to the Kualja Academic and Industrial Institute. This school provided education and vocational training to African American students. The school helped prepare generations of African American students to succeed in a world often hostile to them. Unfortunately, Kualja's success was short-lived. The rise of the Ku Klux Klan and a lack of economic opportunities for African Americans in the area led to the community's decline in the 1920s. By the 1950s, the once thriving community had all disappeared. In the 1960s, the Alabama Power Company purchased the entire land to build a hydroelectric dam, which led to the creation of Lake Martin. The loss of Kualja was a devastating blow to Alabama's black community. It is just one of the many mind-boggling examples of how black communities in America were systematically destroyed and forgotten throughout history. Despite this erasure, efforts are being made to preserve the memory of Kualja and honor its legacy. The Kualja Historical Society was established to preserve and promote the history of Kualja and its contributions to Alabama and the United States. The society has created a museum that showcases the community's rich history, including exhibits on John Benson and the Kualja Academic and Industrial Institute. The society also organizes tours of the area and hosts events celebrating Kualja's heritage. In addition to the work of the Kualja Historical Society, other organizations are also working to preserve and honor the community's memory. The Alabama Historical Commission has designated Kowalja as a historical site, and the National Park Service has recognized the town's contributions to the civil rights movement. The legacy of Kowalja lives on through the efforts of those who seek to honor and remember the community and its contributions to Alabama and the United States. And this is not the only city underwater, as right below the serene water of Lake Lanier is a land that was once thriving with human activities. Oscarville, 
in Georgia. Lake Lanier in Georgia is a popular destination for weekend getaways, attracting visitors with its abundant fishing, boating, and other recreational activities. The lake spans over 38,000 acres and has over 692 miles of shoreline. It is located in the northern part of Georgia and serves as a major source of water supply for the city of Atlanta. However, what many people don't know is that the lake has a dark past. It sits on top of the ruins of Oscarville, a thriving African-American community that was destroyed as far back as 1912. Oscarville was a small black community located in the northeastern part of Forsyth County, Georgia. The community was established in the late 1800s and was home to over 100 black families. The residents of Oscarville were hardworking farmers, carpenters, and other tradespeople who were able to establish a self-sufficient community despite the oppressive Jim Crow laws at the time. In September, two alleged assaults against white women were reported in the county. Two black men were arrested, along with four accomplices. Shortly after, the body of a white resident was found, and several black residents were named as suspects to provide safety. One suspect was transferred, but a mob of angry white residents gathered outside the jail. They seized and beat another suspect to death before hanging him in the town square. After the trials and executions, a group of white men, known as Night Night Riders began a campaign of terror against the black residents of Oscarville. They burned homes, churches, and schools, forcing black families to flee the area. More than a thousand residents were displaced in the aftermath of the violence. The land where Oscarville once stood was eventually purchased by the Army Corps of Engineers, who built Lake Lanier on top of the remains of the destroyed community. The construction of the lake began in the 1950s and was completed in the 1960s. The lake is now a popular destination for recreation and serves as a major source of hydroelectric power for the region. Today, Today, there are reports of eerie occurrences and ghost sightings around the lake, adding to its already haunting history. Many visitors to the lake have reported seeing strange lights, hearing ghostly voices, and feeling a sense of unease in certain areas. Some believe that the ghosts of the former residents of Oscarville are still present at the lake, haunting the place where their homes and communities once stood. The story of Oscarville and its destruction is a horrifying example of the violence and depression encountered in African American communities throughout American history. However, efforts are being made to preserve the memory of Oscarville and honor the lives of those who were lost. The Black Student Union at the University of North Georgia has created a scholarship in the memory of the victims of the Oscarville lynching, and there are ongoing efforts to uncover more information about the community and its history. In recent years, there has been a renewed interest in the history of Oscarville and other similar communities in the South. Organizations like the Georgia Trust for Historic Preservation have worked to document the history of Black communities in Georgia and advocate for their preservation. The Forsyth County Historical Society has also taken steps to recognize the history of Oscarville and other lost communities in the area. Despite the efforts to preserve the memory of Oscarville, the community's history remains largely unknown to the general public. Many visitors to Lake Lanier are unaware of the story beneath the water's surface, but it doesn't end here. Vanport in Oregon is another place now buried underwater. Vanport in Oregon. During World War II, the United States witnessed an unprecedented surge in its manufacturing and industrial sector to support the war effort. This period saw the rapid growth of shipyard industries, which became vital in producing warships and military supplies. One of the shipyards was located in Vanport, Oregon, which quickly became the second largest city in the state. The shipyard industry offered job opportunities, and many people migrated to the city in search of work. As the demand for labor increased, African Americans from the southern states were drawn to the shipyard industry in search of better job opportunities. However, due to systemic racism, the Albina neighborhood was the only place where black people could legally reside. The Albina neighborhood soon became too small to accommodate the growing population, and a solution was needed to address the housing crisis. Vanport was built as a temporary solution to house these new workers. The city was built on a floodplain and this decision would have devastating consequences. At its peak, Vanport housed 40,000 residents, with 40% of them African American. Unfortunately, in 1948, disaster struck the city when the Columbia River flooded the neighborhood. The floodwaters destroyed the town within a day, displacing over 18,500 families, more than a third of whom were black Americans. The aftermath of the flood exposed the systemic racism that existed in Oregon. White supremacists attempted to keep black Americans out of the state, and the state legislature passed laws to preserve the state predominantly white. The Oregon and Black Exclusion Laws restricted black people from owning property or settling in the state, a practice that continued for several years. Even after the laws were repealed in 1956, the legacy of systemic racism lived on. The former residents of Vanport never forgot their lost community and fought for years to preserve its memory. The Vanport Mosaic Festival is held annually to honor the lives lost and celebrate the city's rich history. 
The festival showcases the city's diverse cultural heritage and aims to educate people about the history of Vanport. The festival features a variety of events, including live performances, exhibits, and oral histories from former residents. The legacy of Vanport still resonates with the residents of Portland today. The city has a troubled history of racism and segregation, with the African-American population facing numerous obstacles, including access to education, housing, and job opportunities. However, in recent years, the city has progressed in addressing these issues. It has launched various initiatives to improve the quality of life for the African-American community, including affordable housing, job training, and education programs. The Vanport Mosaic Festival is a testament to the resilience of the former residents of Vanport who fought to preserve the memory of their lost community. While progress has been made in recent years to address the legacy of systemic racism in Portland, much work still needs to be done to achieve equality and justice for all. Next is Sasana, a former village in Alabama, now home to a large lake. But before we get into it, make sure you like this video and subscribe to the channel for more content like this. Thank you for the support. We aren't just telling stories, we're changing lives and waking the culture up. Now let's get back into it. Susanna Village in Alabama. Susanna was one of the most prosperous and thriving small towns in Tallapoosa County, Alabama. This charming farming community boasted a wealth of businesses, including a bank, sawmill, grist mill, post office, and even its own gold mine, situated on Blue Creek between Curry's Point and Stillwaters. Susanna was a beacon of hope for pioneers seeking a new life in the American South. But sadly, Susanna's bright future was not to be. In the early 20th century, the construction of Lake Martin resulted in the town's submergence underwater. The once vibrant streets and bustling businesses were lost forever, leaving only memories and scattered remnants of the past. According to Alabama Living, the flooding of Susanna resulted in the relocation of over 900 bodies from cemeteries in the area. This poignant fact underscores the depth of loss experienced by the people of Susanna, who saw their homes and loved ones swept away by the rising waters. Despite its tragic fate, Susanna's legacy lives on in the hearts and minds of Alabamians and history buffs alike. The town's former glory is evidenced by the wide range of businesses it once supported, including a gold mine, a school, two mercantile stores, a grist mill, a flour mill, a saw mill, a blacksmith shop, and a church. These varied enterprises served as a testament to the ingenuity and perseverance of the people of Susanna, who built a thriving community from the ground up. And lastly, it is the once vibrant Ferguson town in South Carolina. Ferguson town in South Carolina. Ferguson, South Carolina, was once a thriving lumber town founded in the 1880s by Francis Beadler and Benjamin F. Ferguson. The town was established to support the operations of the Santee River Cypress Lumber Company, which was responsible for harvesting old-growth timber from the Blackwater River wetlands in central South Carolina. The firm owned and controlled over 165,000 acres of land, mainly of bald cypress timber. The founders of the Santee River Cypress Lumber Company were both northern lumbermen from Chicago who saw an opportunity to capitalize on the rich timber resources of the South. They purchased large tracts of land and built a sawmill and a kiln to process the timber and to finish products, such as railroad ties and lumber. Ferguson was constructed to house the workers operating the sawmill and other facilities to attract workers to the town. Beadler and Ferguson invested in the infrastructure of the new village. They built paved streets, provided indoor plumbing, and installed street lighting with coal gas. The company town system was used to exploit workers who were paid in an untransferable currency that could only be used at the company store. The town's workers and their families depended entirely on the company for their livelihoods, as there were no other sources of employment in the area. Despite exploiting workers, the town of Ferguson thrived for several decades. The sawmills cut wood, and the kiln produced treated wood products, including creosote-infused railroad ties. The post office began operations in 1890, and the town had several businesses, including a bank, a hotel, and a general store. The town's residents had access to various services and amenities, such as a school, a church, and a library. However, the Santee Cypress Company shut down its Ferguson operations in 1915, which led to the town's decline. Workers were laid off and the post office shut down in 1917. Ferguson became a ghost town, abandoned and forgotten. Over time, the buildings fell into disrepair and were eventually demolished. In the following years, the land that was once Ferguson was repurposed for various projects. The Santee Cooper Power and Navigation Project, which began in 1939, included the construction of the Santee Dam downstream from the Ferguson site. The lake's shallow waters covered most of the town's site, including its streets, buildings, and cemetery. Today, Ferguson is a submerged ghost town that lies beneath the surface of Lake Marion. Despite its disappearance, the legacy of Ferguson lives on. The lumber industry 
industry, which was once the town's lifeblood, is still an essential part of the economy of the South, and many companies continue to harvest timber from the region. The town's story is a reminder of the industry's impact on local communities and the importance of fair labor practices. The submerged town is also a unique site for divers and history buffs who can explore the underwater remains of the town. Lake Marion, which covers an area of about 110,000 acres, is a popular spot for fishing, boating, and other recreational activities. The lake is home to various fish species, including largemouth, bass, catfish, and crappie. There are also several campgrounds, picnic areas, and hiking trails around the lake. The lake's proximity to several major cities in South Carolina makes it a popular weekend getaway destination. This video is crazy, but there's so much more history that they don't want you to learn about. The video on the screen is an interesting story that will open your eyes and change your perspective on life. Click on it now to watch. We'll see you over there.